I'm going to talk about VDFs from uh, obfuscation. And uh, this talk is based on uh, a work together with Bitansky, Goldwasser, Jane, Vaikutanathan, and Waters. Okay, so we're here today to talk about uh, uh, VDFs. And uh, Ron also told us about uh, this notion of time, very related notion of time of puzzles. So um, I'm going to uh, remind you what these are and uh, how they compare to each other. But before we do that, let me start with uh, what these two notions have in common. So th both of these notions are built around uh, what we call inherently sequential functions. So these are functions that take some, that require some uh, long sequential computation that cannot really be accelerated using parallelism. Okay, so let me say that again uh, in a bit more detail. So it's not going to be, I'm not going to give any formal definitions, just, just to convey the high level idea. So we say that uh, a function f is inherently sequential if uh, we can compute it in uh, time t. So given an input x, we can evaluate the output y in time t. But we can't really evaluate any uh, much faster than that. So uh, given a random input, no algorithm that runs, uh, say, in time t over 2 can uh, uh, compute the correct output. And the important thing is that this type of uh, hardness holds even for parallel algorithms. So even if your uh, algorithm runs on multiple processors uh, in parallel, uh, it cannot compute the correct y uh, in time t over 2. So the number of processors can be very large. We allow it to even be larger than t. But it should not be exponential. We only want hardness against algorithms that are uh, still efficient. So in terms of parameters, uh, um, uh, every application will require a different delay parameter t. So we want to design functions where uh, we can tune t as we like. Also, the gap between uh, the time t that it takes to compute the function and the time in which you should not be able to compute the function, the gap does not have to be t over 2. We can define it to be uh, whatever we need it to be. And uh, uh, our goal is to design these inherently sequential function where the gap is as small as uh, possible. Okay, so let me give you some examples of uh, functions uh, uh, that we are, are believed to be inherently sequential. Uh, we've already mentioned them today. So first of all, we have iterated hashing. Take some cryptographic hash function, uh, mapping n bit string to n bit string, and just apply it on itself uh, uh, t times. And for simplicity, we think about every hashing as taking one unit of time. So unless your hash function is really bad, uh, there shouldn't be uh, uh, any other way to compute the output other than just t sequential hashing. Second example is a, a repeated squaring in a, a group of honor and order. For example, a multiplication mod n, where n is the product of two large primes. So uh, the input is x, and the output is x to the power of 2 to the t. We can compute this uh, uh, with t uh, squarings. So as Ron mentioned, if you know uh, the factorization of n, you can actually compute the output uh, faster than that. But if the factorization is unknown, uh, the best we know how to do is t sequential squaring. The last example that I want to mention uh, has kind of a different flavor from the first two. So the idea is to use secure hardware, secure hardware to implement uh, an inherently sequential function. So think about uh, the secure hardware component that has a secret key, k, uh, hidden inside of it. And given an input x, uh, it just does nothing. It waits for time t. And then it uh, evaluates what we call a pseudo-random function uh, on x, this is a function that looks completely random for someone that does not know the secret key. So if you know the uh, key k, you can compute the, fact, the function uh, by yourself immediately. But since the key is hidden inside the hardware, the only way to compute this function is to use this hardware and incur this delay. OK, so I'm not an expert on hardware. But to me, this idea of basing our security on this one key k remaining completely hidden inside this hardware for years to come Seems like a pretty bad idea. So um, one really interesting suggestion in this context is to use, instead of secure hardware, what we call program obfuscation. So the idea is that instead of giving you a hardware implementation of this function, we'll give you a software implementation. We'll give you a code. But this code is going to be completely scrambled or obfuscated in such a way that uh, you can still run this code. You can still evaluate this function. But if you look at the code, the secret key k is kind of completely hidden in there. So you can execute uh, this code, but you can never understand how it works. So this concept of program obfuscation may sound a little too good to be true. But actually, in the last few years, we had a really amazing uh, uh, progress on obfuscating such programs. So, the, uh, so currently, the obfuscation construction that we have 
are still uh, very far from being practical, but I still think that this is a really uh, interesting approach uh, to constructing uh, inherently sequential functions, and I'll say more about this uh, uh, soon. Maybe we should all, all the theoreticians should go into the business of delay functions, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So, uh, uh, so we talk about some examples. Now let's go back to where we started from and uh, talk about uh, VDFs, uh, verifiable delay functions and time lock puzzles. So time lock puzzles are basically just inherently sequential functions that also have a trap door. So I can generate the function together with some secret trapdoor that will allow me to evaluate the function uh, very fast without a delay. So everyone else uh, requires a, a time t to evaluate the function, but using the trapdoor I can evaluate it immediately. So this turns out to be a, an extremely powerful concept. It has uh, many cool applications. Uh, just one example, I can encrypt a message uh, to the future. So for example, I can encrypt my, uh, uh, publish an encryption of my secret diary so that they only come, become decryptable in uh, say 100 years from today when I'm uh, already dead and famous. <laughs> so moving on to verifiable delay functions, uh, these are uh, inherently sequential functions where together with the output, we can also compute a proof that this output is really correct. Y is really equal to f of x and everyone should be able to verify this proof uh, fast. So much faster than t. So verifying this proof does not require you to recompute, reevaluate the function. So uh, these also have uh, a lot of exciting applications. For example, this uh, powerful notion of randomness beacon, uh, more resource efficient uh, uh, blockchain protocols, and uh, many more. Okay. So as you may already notice, these two notions of time lock puzzle, time lock puzzles, and VDFs are incomparable to each other. And this will become even more clear when we go back to our examples of inherently sequential functions and uh, turn them into VDFs and time lock puzzles. So our first example was iterated hashing. You can take this function or actually any inherently sequential function for that matter and turn it into a VDF by uh, using what we call SNARKs, uh, succinct non-interactive arguments. So if by chance you didn't hear about them, these are these uh, uh, proof systems that have extremely efficient verification. So I can uh, prove something like uh, y is equal to f of x, and anybody can verify much faster than uh, reevaluating the computation. So today, SNARKs still have a very large overhead in practice, and this uh, work of Bonedal has some uh, really uh, uh, cool ideas on how to construct uh, even more efficient VDFs uh, by combining iterated hashing and SNARKs in more sophisticated ways. So really, the major drawback of iterated hashing is that we have no idea how to use it for time lock puzzles. We don't have any uh, trapdoor that will allow us to somehow accelerate this computation. Which brings us to our second example of repeated squaring. So um, Rivet, Shamir, and Wagner suggested to use this as a time lock puzzle, where the trapdoor is uh, the order uh, of the multiplicative group, so uh, phi of n. So if you know phi of n, you can first reduce the modulus 2 to the t uh, mod phi of n, and then you can compute the output with just one additional exponentiation. So getting VDFs out of repeated squaring turns out to be uh, uh, much more tricky. So you can always use a, a phi of n to verify the output fast, but we want everyone to be able to verify the output. Now if we just publish phi of n, then our functions just become easy to compute. We did nothing. Now it turns out that there are more sophisticated ways to prove that y is really equal to f of x, ways that do not use the trap door. And this was discovered uh, very recently in these uh, two beautiful independent works. Okay, so on to our uh, last example. We obfuscate a program that delays and then evaluates a pseudorandom function on the input. So intuitively, because we're already using a very heavy hammer like program obfuscation, then uh, it's not surprising that getting time lock puzzles and VDFs is kind of straightforward. So for time lock puzzles, uh, your trapdoor is just going to be k, the key of the pseudorandom function. So if you have k, you can compute this function yourself. You don't need to go through the obfuscated program. You don't need to uh, 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 wait uh, any time. In terms of uh, turning them into VDF, the idea is to use a digital signature. So we're going to change this obfuscated program to also contain a secret signing key. And the program is going to output, in addition to y, a signature on the pair x and y. 
So the proof is just the signature, and to verify the output, you just verify the signature. Now, because no one else except this obfuscated program can produce valid signatures, then no one can uh, prove the wrong output. Okay, so we've seen some uh, examples of inherently sequential functions, uh, how to turn them into VDFs and time lock puzzles. So now I want to step, uh, take a step back for a bit and uh, ask the following question. So uh, are all these functions really inherently sequential? So we conjecture that they are. Uh, we certainly don't have any devastating attacks on them. But uh, before we put our money on this conjecture, literally, what makes us so confident that this conjecture really holds? <coughs> so this is a really important uh, question uh, on our agenda. We're going to attack it with everything we got from many different directions. We have like five different workshops on this. So uh, uh, we want to design the best parallel algorithms for uh, computing these functions. In terms of hardware, uh, uh, we want to minimize the performance gaps between the bad guys and the good guys. We also use uh, really uh, beautiful mathematics to design new functions and uh, try to assess their security. And finally, uh, we're using crypto and complexity. So these fields, uh, in these fields, we study hard computational problems, how we can use them uh, in, to our advantage. And uh, this is, of course, useful for designing inherently sequential function. So this is the path that uh, I want to uh, go down today. So the question that I want to uh, focus on uh, for the rest of this talk is whether we can construct inherently sequential functions where uh, the security, the sequentiality, is not just a conjecture. Uh, we can actually prove it based on kind of well-studied uh, cryptographic assumptions. So in some more details, uh, what I'm proposing is to construct an inherently sequential function based on standard cryptographic primitives, uh, something like one-way functions or maybe collision-resistant hashing, or even stronger uh, objects like uh, maybe fully homomorphic encryption. And the idea is that we want to be able to prove the security of uh, this function based on the security of these underlying primitives. So if uh, we're able to do this, this would be really great because currently we only have very few constructions of uh, VDFs and time lock puzzles. Their securities are based on these ad hoc conjectures. But in contrast, these primitives can be based on a whole array of uh, uh, hardness assumptions, hardness of factoring, discrete log, learning with errors problem. Um, so this would give us uh, new constructions of inherently sequential functions where uh, the security is, uh, can actually be based on cryptographic assumptions that are extremely well studied. Okay, so really, the only problem with uh, this picture is that we don't know how to construct such inherently sequential functions. In fact, there seem to be some uh, inherent barrier for constructing such functions based on cryptography alone. So let me explain uh, why we don't believe that cryptography alone is enough. So essentially, any hardness assumptions that we use in cryptography uh, looks something like this. It says that no polynomial time adversary can do something, invert a function, distinguish encryptions of two messages. So our assumptions, uh, they talk about adversaries that are efficient, but the assumption really doesn't care how efficient the adversary is. In particular, we don't care if the adversary runs in time t, or time t over 2, or how many processors it uses. Now, in contrast, for inherently sequential function, this is exactly what we need. We need something that is easy to do in time t, but hard to do in time t over 2. So what we need is kind of a much more fine-grained uh, hardness assumption. So another way to look at this uh, barrier is to imagine that uh, we live in a world where uh, every efficient computation can actually be parallelized. In the language of complexity theory, we say that the complexity class P is equal to NC. So this world seems a little unlikely, but as far as we know, it's not impossible. And in this world, all of our uh, cryptography that we know and love can still exist. But because every computation can be parallelized, then inherently sequential functions clearly are impossible. OK, so this is just to uh, show you that crypto is probably not enough. Uh, this is our barrier. And for the time that I have left, I want to tell you um, how to overcome this barrier, how to construct VDFs and time lock puzzles uh, that are provably uh, secure, provably sequential, under uh, the following two hardness assumptions. So first, we have a cryptographic assumption. And as we said, this is not uh, enough. We also need to make a minimal uh, complexity theoretic assumption. So uh, our cryptographic assumption is uh, uh, the existence of something called indistinguishability obfuscation. Uh, 
as I mentioned before, uh, obfuscation is this a, a very powerful uh, cryptographic tool, and uh, recently we were, we were able to construct such indistinguishability obfuscation from new mathematical assumptions. So this is a, a very active uh, area uh, of research today, and our uh, confidence in this assumption is increasing uh, with time. In terms of our uh, complexity assumption, we basically need to assume that there exists some computation that cannot be parallelized. This is, uh, it seems like a very mild assumption. We'll see that it's also necessary. So I'm gonna say more about uh, both of these assumptions in the next uh, couple of slides. But uh, uh, before we go into that, let me just go ahead and show you uh, what the construction is. Okay, so if this construction looks familiar, it's because we've just talked about it five minutes ago. So the construction is just an obfuscated program that given an input x does nothing for t steps, and then it evaluates a, a pseudorandom function on uh, the input. Okay, so the obfuscation that uh, we're going to use here is called indistinguishability obfuscation. Let me tell you what that means. So uh, uh, the security that we're guaranteed here is that uh, uh, for every pair of programs, P1 and P2, uh, uh, that are functionally equivalent, so for every input, uh, uh, both of these programs produce exactly the same output. If you obfuscate these two programs, the obfuscations you get are indistinguishable from each other. So if you look at, uh, 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 you can't tell if you're looking at the obfuscation of one program or the other. So in order to prove the security of our construction, we'll also need a, a obfuscation a, that is, a, a, we need the obfuscation of this program to be very short. So we want that the size of the obfuscated program does not grow with the running time of the program. It only grows with the description of the code itself. So the obfuscation of this program should be much smaller than a t. And again, we know how to construct such indistinguishability obfuscation a, a, with this type of efficiency. Great, so uh, as I mentioned before, this gives us an inherently sequential function and now we can turn this into time lock puzzles and VDFs. So the trapdoor for a time lock puzzle is just the uh, key K for the pseudorandom function. And for VDFs, we're going to add a digital signature scheme. Uh, uh, the signature on X and Y is the proof and to verify the proof, you just verify the signature. Okay, so this is the same construction, kind of the natural construction uh, uh, you would uh, 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 come up with based on obfuscation. Really the interesting part is uh, how can we argue that this construction is really secure, is really sequential? So let me tell you about the uh, uh, proof of security. And this is where our uh, hardness assumption is uh, uh, coming into the picture. So uh, uh, this is, we're going to make the following uh, uh, complexity theoretic assumption. We're going to assume that uh, there exists what we call non-parallelizing uh, decision problems. So a decision problem S is just a function that maps every string to a binary outcome, either yes or no. And we say that this uh, decision problem is non-parallelizing if, uh, first of all, you can uh, compute S, uh, compute the function in time T, but uh, no uh, algorithm that runs in time, uh, say, T over two, can uh, compute this function correctly on the worst case. So no algorithm can succeed in computing it correctly on every single input. So this hardness assumption kind of reminds us of uh, uh, the notion of inherently sequential function, but the security that we're asking for here is much weaker. We're only asking for worst case security rather than average case. So here, our adversaries need to fail uh, uh, on one input, and in inherently sequential function, the adversary uh, is required to fail on almost all the inputs, all but, say, a negligible fraction. So really what we're going to show is uh, what we call a worst case to average case reduction. We're going to prove that uh, if you can compute the inherently sequential function uh, uh, on a random input x with some good probability uh, in time, say, t over three, then uh, it means that you can also solve uh, the decision problem S on the worst case for every input uh, in slightly longer time, T over two, still much faster than T. Okay, so before we move on, I just wanna uh, mention that this seems like a very mild, very believable assumption. Uh, uh, so intuitively, if this assumption is false, uh, it means that essentially, it means that every computation can be parallelized and this would be extremely surprising. Uh, also, I want to emphasize that for our constructions to be secure, we don't need to know what is this uh, decision problem S that cannot be parallelized. We just need that such a decision problem exists. So our construction does not depend on the uh, problem S. We're only going to uh, use S in the security proof. 
Okay, so, uh, um, so without further ado, let me show you uh, uh, the proof. So say that there was some adversary that runs in time uh, t over three, and this adversary takes a, 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 an input, and the function it correctly computes the function. So usually, uh, uh, we want security against adversaries that get to see the function, and we only start the clock when they get the input. But uh, uh, for simplicity today, we're gonna think about an adversary that gets both the input and the function at the same time. Proving the more general case is just slightly more complicated. Okay, so now let's uh, consider another experiment where we take the same adversary, and we feed it uh, with a different obfuscated program that also waits for time t, but then it just outputs bottom. It never gives you the correct output. In fact, it doesn't even know the key. So given this uh, program, we expect the adversary to uh, produce the wrong output. Okay, so now we're going to consider a final experiment where we give the adversary a, a third obfuscated program. Uh, this program also runs for a long time, for time t, but unlike the two other programs, this program is actually going to do something useful with its time. So it has some uh, input z to the decision problem, and uh, uh, it decides whether this uh, uh, s of z is yes or no. So we can do that in time t. If s uh, uh, outputs yes, then we output the correct output y, and if it says no, then we just give the wrong output bottom. Okay, so now we're going to use the security of uh, obfuscation. We're going to use indistinguishability obfuscation. So note that if uh, s of z is no, then the function in the middle and the function here on the uh, left are functionally equivalent, okay? So they both output bottom uh, uh, in, on, uh, in all cases. So this means that these two obfuscated programs are going to be indistinguishable from each other, which means that in both cases, the adversary has to produce the wrong output. Otherwise, the adversary actually distinguishes between these two programs. Similarly, if S uh, outputs yes, then these two programs are now functionally equivalent. <laughs> And this means that in both cases, the adversary is gonna produce the right output. So just by uh, taking the adversary, feeding it with this program on the middle, and seeing whether it outputs the correct thing or the wrong thing, we can learn whether Z, the answer to uh, uh, the input Z is yes or no, and we can do this on the worst case. We can do it for every input Z. So note that uh, uh, because the adversary runs in time T over three, and this obfuscation is small, it's much smaller than T, unlike this picture, then overall uh, the time to the side S is less than T over, than, uh, T over two. So this contradicts the security of uh, the decision, the uh, uh, non-parallelism of the decision problem. This means that our adversary could not succeed to begin with. Okay, so this is all I wanna tell you about the security proof. So just to conclude, uh, I showed you how to construct verifiable delay functions and uh, time lock puzzles based on, uh, uh, that are provably secure based on indistinguishability obfuscation and uh, uh, kind of a worst case complexity assumption that we called non-parallelizing problems. And uh, that's it, thank you. We seem to, we're trying to prove polynomial term lower bound, but we're using these cryptographic assumptions that don't distinguish between uh, uh, different polynomials. So, so I think the main contribution is that uh, we're willing to make these assumptions that some computations cannot be parallelized, but we're much more comfortable in making these assumptions on the worst case rather than the average case. So it, it makes sense that we cannot, com that uh, uh, every algorithm makes we can parallelize every computation on every input, but asking that you know, there is a specific computation and we know what it is and we can sample hard instances and every instance is hard, this seems like it requires some tools. There is no reason that we'll need something as strong as indistinguishability obfuscation. As far as we know, we can do this. We might be able to do this from one way function. We do, need that, we do know that some crypto is necessary. For example, we know that the notion of time lock puzzles does imply a average case hardness like one way functions. But uh, uh, improving the assumption is a great question, yeah. For those not, there are not previous instability or position uh, practicality, you said, did you mentioned that there were some schemes that could be, which we could be implementing this in practice, but they will take a long time. Is that what you said at the beginning? Or I think that's a little bit smart, smart. Maybe, I don't know. So there are many uh, obfuscation solutions that are uh, heuristic, that are practical. 
but um, they work for different type of programs. For these programs that have like a secret key for a pseudo random function inside, uh, they will be uh, broken you know, in hours, days, months, to tops. So uh, um, what is uh, uh, significantly different with our new obfuscation solutions is that they're really based on like this solid mathematics and uh, uh, we don't believe you'll be able to solve them in a, a reasonable time, but today they're completely impractical. They're just kind of feasibility results. Code so what, what my final question was, could even if they're really big source, could we encode something and do some form of unlock and say that in 30 years someone will solve it? Because it could be an incentive for the community to do that. So let me explain what I mean. So the overhead of computing the sophistication would be so large that it would introduce an inherent gap between the time to compute honestly and the time that the adversary can compute. For, mo for some applications, this gap might be uh, okay, but I think for most applications that we have in mind, this inherent gap is too much. We need more efficient obfuscation. So efficiency is not uh, always the enemy here. <laughs> also, you don't want to have an obfuscated program up there that is like too large. Why is the existence of a, of a circuit that is not parallelizable in the worst case an assumption as opposed to fact? We don't have hierarchy here in the circuit. fact that no one can prove. It's because P could equal to NC. So what we do know is that there are hierarchy theorems. There are problems that require more time than other problems, problems that require at least N to the squared, N cubed, and fourth time, N to the fourth time. Uh, we don't have these hierarchy theorems for non-uniform models like circuits or, or, or whatever you want to uh, uh, model your computation as. And um, so, so I still think that, so this is an unproven conjecture, but I think it's a very mild one. If we have a computation model, which is, for example, just NAND bits, mm -hmm. uh, and you know that uh, N bits square um, at the minimum, you need to read the N bits, right, in the worst case. And so, I admit, if you only have two input gates, the best you can do to read all the bits is to have this tree of depth log n. So that's extremely uh, good uh, parallel running time. What we want is uh, uh, functions that have short input, but they run much longer than their input. So your function is kind of uh, wide and short. We want a function that is very tall and very narrow. Like the kind of hard state that I talked about. The input is like 24 bits, so you can make a lot of time that's super, super happy. It's added. Right, so that's basically the extent of our lower bounds, and if we can push beyond that, that would be a pretty amazing result in complexity theory. I mean, what is more of an observation than the question is, I think you, you can take um, any BDF and turn it into a timer puzzle uh, without uh, uh, backdoor, and, and you can do that by basically using witness encryption. So you feed the DDF proof mm -hmm. as a witness, mm -hmm. uh, and you get it. Right. So, yeah, so what, what's the suggestion is to use a, a kind of primitives that are, are in the same domain as obfuscation in terms of the cryptographic map. They have this very uh, uh, strong uh, uh, functionality uh, uh, to maybe not just construct these puzzles from scratch, but maybe you know, understand the connections between things like VDFs and Timelock puzzle, introducing trapdoors into our construction, for sure. Um, so beyond the three examples that I suggested, uh, good. I'm not the right person to answer this question. Um, I think computing GCDs in like uh, large fields, this could be uh, uh, sparse polynomials even. And um, any other ideas? If you don't know how to set the point, you can compute it in parallel time proportional to the input length. Uh, we want to set the parallel time to be much larger. I see. But even a p-space complete problem, even you know, take this Turing machine and tell me what it outputs, uh, would be a, a great inherently sequential problem in the worst case. And uh, turning it into the average case is you're going to have to. You can use something like this, or maybe there's something more sophisticated. <laughs>